of people. So I think we can start. Okay, uh, so today, after May 3rd break, we have last three talks by uh, Dr. Moxon Haidari. He did his PhD in University of Michigan, mostly in communication, but then he branched out to quantum and machine learning. <clears throat> he joined uh, me here at the center two years ago, and he just uh, got a position at uh, uh, IU, Indiana University, and he'll be moving there in August. A few things about the last three talks. So today will be about feature selection. Next week <clears throat> will be more on quantum and um, and neural quantum neural network. And the last the last meeting that we have May twenty fourth will be an interesting one because Moxon is organizing a workshop quantum workshop which will last from uh, 10 o'clock our time, which is four o'clock Krakow term, till about uh, four hour time, which is 10 o'clock your time. Most likely Mox and Tom, Mox and will be talking and he will be talking at 11, so five o'clock. We will give you a link and you can join and watch the whole workshop. And this will be basically it. I will check with Dr. Trudowski about uh, about great, but basically everybody will, will, will we basically pass everybody and I, I, I will have to figure out what to do. But that's that, that basically the introduction box and the floor is yours. So please, you can start. Okay, thank you, Wojtek, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the feature selection problem and the new approach that we were trying to develop, which is based on a discrete Fourier expansion. So I'm going to uh, talk about, about the uh, basic uh, definitions and then I will go through more uh, comprehensive uh, solutions and approaches. And uh, please don't hesitate to stop me if you have any questions and I'll try to uh, convey as much as I can. Okay. Let's start with that. So today, uh, basically, I'm going to start with uh, the problem of feature selection and why it matters. And it has two parts. It has uh, feature selection in unsupervised settings and feature selection in the supervised settings. I'm going to talk about each of them separately. Also, I'm going to talk about uh, what I mean by discrete Fourier expansion, or more specifically, the, Boole the Boolean Fourier expansion. This is the first part of this series of the talk. Then in the next part, as Wojtek mentioned, I'm going to talk about learning from quantum data, which is due next week and the week after. Okay, so let's start with this problem. So now we know that nowadays uh, we have more data-driven technologies that we have been able to collect a lot of more data and we can process uh, significant amounts of data to, to mine data, mine information from this data. Particularly in healthcare, we have more, com more complicated and more comprehensive medical profiles for patients, including DNA data, MRI images, and so on. And um, computationally speaking, um, although we do not have any problem processing all the data points in our data set. Uh, however, for some reason, we would like to reduce the complexity of the problem by reducing the amount of the data or reducing the dimension of the data. And that's a motivation for feature search. Uh, the reasons are basically threefold. Um, one is that having a smaller set of uh, features to work on uh, increases the interpretability of the model. So if, for instance, uh, a doctor can look at only a handful of the measurements, uh, the doctor will have a, a more a vision of, uh, more visualization of the data, more visualizations of the medical profile. So it's less uh, complicated. Secondly, is about accuracy. Um, 
So we would like to reduce the dimension in order to defy the curse of dimensionality. And lastly, it's about the cost because if we reduce the number of measurements, we are basically reducing the number of medical experiments, uh, the data processing time, so it would be less cost, um, less amount of processing. So all of these boils down to the feature selection um, uh, approach. Uh, basically in feature selection, we uh, would like to remove as many features as possible to reduce the dimension of the data without affecting the prediction accuracy. I'm gonna define it more details in the next couple of slides. Okay, let's, let's talk about the learning setup now. Um, so as usual, uh, we are starting with a training set. So we have N labeled samples and the samples consist of features and labels. Features are going to be vectors in RD, dimension uh, D, we have X1 up to XD. And the labels uh, for now, we are assuming we are looking at binary classification. So uh, the label is just binary. And so given this training sample, then the learning algorithm processes the training sets and finds a predictor. And then we would like to test this predictor. Uh, for that, we look at a test sample, which we haven't seen previously. Uh, we give the features test to the predictor and the predictor outputs Y hat. And then we can define a loss between Y hat and Y. For instance, we can talk about misclassification error, uh, which is basically the zero one loss, uh, the indicator function, whether y hat equals to the true y or not. And in these setups, uh, typically D is very large, but uh, we will understand that not all the features are useful to predict y. Maybe a handful of the features are used to get a very good accuracy for predicting y. So let's look at these three different categories of features. Uh, on one hand, we have relevant features, right? So let's say the colors are the labels and we have this feature F1. So as you can see, it's a relevant features because having F1, we can predict Y. But we have another category of features that we call them redundant, meaning that uh, suppose we have two features now, F1 and F2, and as you can see, they have very high correlation among them. So this means that uh, among F1 and F2, I just need to look at one of them. The other one is relevant when we have access to the other one. And lastly, we have irrelevant features. For instance, F3 here, uh, if you can see from the picture, Having F3, we don't have much of a predictive power in order to predict the color of these dots. So these are these uh, three categories of features and we would like to uh, remove as much as possible of the part B and part C, which are redundant and irrelevant features. For redundant features, we basically need to study the dependencies among the features themselves. We don't need to look at the label so we can do that also in an unsupervised fashion. Uh, the other one is relevant feature. Uh, so for that, we need to look at the relation between the features and the label, and that is done in a supervised fashion. So I'm going to talk uh, on each of them separately. Now, another point I wanted to mention uh, is the difference between feature selection and feature extraction, or basically dimensionality reduction. So Note that feature selection uh, is a special case of dimensionality reduction where we try to keep the original features. We don't want to scramble the features or map them into another space. Uh, for instance, if we have D features, maybe we want just to select the first K1 and we don't want to process them or, 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 or combine them together. We just want to select them. In feature, select, feature extraction, however, it's a more general approach. So where we transform uh, the, the dimensional data into a fewer uh, dimensional space. And as a result, we are kind of mixing the features. So we are not having access to the original features, rather we have access to a mixed version of them. 
For instance, an example of this is the PCA, principal component analysis, where we basically take the d-dimensional feature a vector multiplied by a matrix and reduce the dimension to k. So um, now let's dive more into the feature selection problem. Here's the formal definition. Now we have the environment which generates for us the samples. So there's an underlying distribution and there's alphabet size X and Y. Typically X is RD and Y is binary. So the, the environment generates for us the samples. And by the way, we don't have access to the environment. We don't know D. Uh, so we, we just know that the samples are coming from an IID distribution. So we have N samples here. And then the task of feature selection is to find the subset J of one to D and pass it through the learning algorithm. And the learning algorithm only process these feature subsets and uh, applies that to the training samples and try to find uh, the best predictor. Then we have a loss function, which is a function from the class of predictors, uh, the features, the y, and into our plus. For instance, we can talk about expected loss, we can talk about uh, probability of error and all sorts of uh, uh, loss that is already been defined. And the objective is to, again, to remove as many features as possible without significantly affecting the loss. So now, uh, in order to remove these uh, redundancies that I mentioned, so we know that uh, in practice, many high dimensional data sets have many redundant or irrelevant features. Uh, some of these relations, some of these redundancies are linear. For instance, we might have a feature XI, which is a linear combination of some of the other features. These are usually easy to identify and that's already been studied extensively. But there are other type of more complicated redundancy structures that are nonlinear. So in that case, a feature XI could be an arbitrary nonlinear function of K other features. And because of that, so these type of redundancies are more difficult to catch. And so that raises the question that how can we capture these multivariate and nonlinear relations uh, in a data sets? So there are two major approaches so far. One is based on a uh, kernel. Uh, the idea is to map the data into higher dimensional space and then process the data there and then move everything back. This is usually computationally very expensive. The other type of approaches are based on information theoretic measures where uh, we try to estimate, um, uh, for instance, mutual information or entropy to gather these uh, redundancies. But the issue is that typically these information theoretic measures require high number of samples. They have a high sample complexity. In this work, we try to um, have a Fourier-based approach that is both uh, computationally efficient and has uh, less number of sample complexity as compared to these approaches. Okay, now let me uh, make it a bit more formal by defining the optimal feature selection. Now, suppose we are having, we are talking about binary classification and this is our loss. So in ideal setting, Suppose for the moment that we know the distribution, then the optimal feature selection is defined as follows. We have a, K dot, we have a parameter K, which is less than D. We want to find K features out of the D features in order to minimize the loss of the best classifier, basically this optimization problem. So we would like to search over all feature subsets of size K in order to minimize the probability of error. And the probability of error is defined based on the best classifier. And now, but this is not useful in practice. In practice, we don't have access to the distribution. The distribution is unknown. So in that case, we have to have a, an intermediate measure MN, which works on the samples. And then we have this optimization problem based on these samples. 
and we would like to design a measure MN such that the, the features that we find with this measure uh, gives us a probability of error that is as close as possible to the optimal probability. So if there is any question, maybe it's a good time for me to pause here for a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna study this in two fashion. One is unsupervised and the other one is supervised. So let me start with the unsupervised uh, feature selection. Uh, so in unsupervised, as I mentioned, uh, we don't have access to the label. And we would like to study the statistical relations between the features themselves and finding the relevant, uh, finding the redundant features. The idea is that uh, we would like to uh, find redundant features uh, so that no information is lost from the data. Therefore, we have this question. What is a good measure of information loss? How can we define that? For example, let me give you an example. So let's say we have 31 features and X1 up to X31. Let's say the first 10 features are um, IID, Gaussian uh, with the mean zero and variance one. And let's say uh, X11 up to X21 are linear redundant. Each of them is a linear combination of the first 10 features. And the last parts, are nonlinear redundant. So they are basically a nonlinear, let's say, of a function of this form, xj1 times xj2 times xj2, basically a polynomial of degree three. Suppose each of them is a function of this form of the first. Thing. So clearly we know that, well, with the first 10, we can have any information about the data because the, the rest are redundant. So, Based on this, now, if we have a data set, let's say, based on these samples, now, if we run a state-of-the-art algorithms that are listed here, and if we uh, draw the classification accuracy based on the number of selected features, this is a curve that we get usually. And as you can see, the, the maximum achieves at around 15 features. But we know that we have only 10 relevant features. So we should be getting a number around here. And the reason we are not getting around here because most of these uh, approaches work well with linear redundant features, not nonlinear redundant. So therefore we need a kind of a measure of feature redundancy that can tackle these nonlinearities. So, we try to develop this based on the notion of entropy, which is a measure of an uncertainty, but also lack of redundancy. We can think of it this way. This is the equation for the entropy. Now, now we can define this notion of sufficiently informative, similar to sufficient statistics. So here we would like to have to, to, to view the problem from an information theoretic perspective. So we say that um, we have a subset of features uh, containing the same amount of information as all the features. Let's say we are looking at XJ1 up to XJK. If we calculate the entropy, and if the entropy was equal to the entropy of X1 up to XD, then we call this subset to be sufficiently informative, meaning that we don't have any information loss. We can play with that. We can define epsilon sufficient informative, basically meaning that um, the entropy of the selected features is not uh, far away from the entropy of the whole data sets, where epsilon here is usually very small. So with this notion now, we can talk about um, features being redundant, uh, features that are not sufficiently informative can be removed. And also, since we are looking at entropy, we automatically tackle nonlinear redundancies and also the joint effect of the features. When we have an issue, the issue is that, well, for feature selection, if we want to find the smallest feature subset that is epsilon sufficiently informative, the challenge is to estimate the entropy. And as I mentioned, 
uh, information theoretic measures tend to be uh, uh, difficult in terms of sample complexity. For instance, if we assume all the features are binary, we need order of two power d number of samples uh, in order to estimate the entropies. So one solution here now is that we try to make a connection to the discrete Fourier expansion and using which we can, um, uh, instead of estimating the entropy, we can estimate some Fourier coefficients, which are much, much easier to estimate. So let me go over that part then. Um, maybe I can pause for a little bit if there's any question. Okay, so um, this notion of Fourier analysis or discrete Fourier uh, expansion is defined for functions on Boolean Q, basically functions with binary inputs. And uh, it states that any such function can be uniquely written in terms of this decomposition. And this decomposition runs over all subsets of one to D. And these chi -S's are essentially monomial functions. They're basically of this form when J belongs to S. And uh, FSS are the Fourier coefficients and uh, are calculated based on this equation. So we can think of it as some sort of an inner product between the function and the excess. And this is a typo here, this should be F. So this gives us a Fourier expansion for uniform input. Now we can talk about non-uniform input, but product probabilities. Well, the idea is that we can uh, essentially uh, centralize and normalize the, uh, the parities or the monomial function. And now instead of having the uniform average, we can have expectation between F and X. So this gives us the Fourier expansion. Let me give you an example. Okay, let's look at the logical OR function on two bits. Now for convenience, let me use minus one for zero and one for y. So it's a plus minus one bit. This is the true stable for the OR function. Now, if you apply the, the first type of Fourier expansion, which is for uniform distribution, uh, we get this uh, expression on the right-hand side. And it is not difficult to check that the right-hand side exactly satisfies the truth table here. Now, if we look at, let's say, uh, inputs that are IID with bias P 0.1, then the right-hand side is going to change to this expression, which is, again, the same Fourier, but with the centralization and normalization as before. So this is some sort of a, a distribution-dependent Fourier expansion. And the dependency on the uh, input distribution is very important because in machine learning, we are dealing with random inputs. So now again, let me revisit that. So now we have this Fourier expansion. Uh, we try to use that for machine learning applications, but the issue is that first, we need to know the distribution. And secondly, it only works with uh, a uniform or product probability distributions. So meaning that we can only look at independent features, but that kills, the, kills its application because independent features are not redundant at all. So therefore, in order to handle these restrictions and issues, we try to have a more a general Fourier expansion. Uh, we call it a probabilistic Fourier expansion. So it works with any distribution, any arbitrary distribution. So now, instead of the original expansion, now we can talk about this expansion where the idea is to take these parities and orthogonalize them based on this distribution D. And this uh, Fourier uh, coefficients are now based on uh, the expectation over distribution D. And now one other thing that's going to happen is that uh, I'm going to talk about it. When we do the orthogonalization, it automatically uh, cancels the non-redundant features. And I'm going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. And this actually automatically gives us the unsupervised feature selection algorithms. 
But the other part with the Fourier coefficients is going to give us the supervised feature selection, uh, which I'm going to talk about in the next part of the talk. Okay. So let me start with the uh, uh, orthogonalization. It's based on a Gram-Schmidt type orthogonalization, where the idea is first to we sort the features from empty, uh, basically we sort all the subsets of one to D from empty one, two, one, two, three, and then all the way up to one, uh, one, two, three, up to D. So uh, based on that, then we apply the Gram-Schmidt type orthogonalization which are these two equations that are kind of recursive equations. And uh, as you can see, so based on that, um, we have a normalization here and the normalization happens uh, if the norm two of this intermediate quantity is positive. Now we can immediately talk about redundancy measure. But you may ask that, uh, well, here we are again, Assuming that D is known, while well, we have implementations for agnostic settings without knowing D, well, the idea is to uh, first uh, look at subsets of size at most T, and then we can have empirical orthogonalization. So it's a basically series of uh, recursive formulas based on the empirical co correlation coefficients, which is this matrix and these sorts of equations without even knowing the distribution D. So with this correlated Fourier expansion, now we can talk about um, this general proposition that says that any function now can be written in terms of uh, these new orthogonalized parities. And now this gives us um, um, some sort of uh, effective dimension because the reason is that when we do this orthogonalization, if there are features that are redundant, either linear or nonlinear, then they are not going to be appear in the summation here. Meaning that uh, this orthogonalization automatically removes the redundant features because we are, because we are doing the orthogonalization with this uh, equation. So it automatically gives us this notion of effective dimension, basically the, the minimum number of uh, non-trivial uh, parities or non-trivial features to work with. Okay, so here now is the connection to the sufficient informative that I talked before. Um, let's look at uh, this subset J epsilon. Uh, let's define it to be all the features for which the single element uh, psi tilde, uh, if we calculate its norm two is greater than epsilon. If you take that, then uh, we can prove that J epsilon is order of epsilon sufficiently informative. So it has a direct connection to the entropy. Furthermore, if we look at binary features, then uh, with epsilon equal to zero, we get sufficiently informative with minimum cardinality. This is important essentially because it says that uh, when we are focusing only on binary features, then we automatically get the minimum possible K of non-redundant features. So as a result, we have uh, this norm two quantity, a measure of redundancy of the features. And it works for non-binary features as well and it is uh, um, suitable for unsupervised feature selection. Okay, so now we can talk about a couple of more approximations that we did. Basically, we looked at not all the feature subsets, but we limited the size of the feature subset, basically the depth of the search. We can do grouping in order to reduce the complexity and again have the uh, recursive formulas that I mentioned before. So now with that, you can check that uh, the computational complexity is going to be linear in the dimension D and linear in N. And typically we, we take this parameter T to be one or two and this parameter M to be fixed number. So we, we, we severely limit the number of uh, depths and the size of the groups of the features. So, 
here, here again, the same example that I mentioned. Now we apply this algorithm to that and gives us this point, which is very close to number 10. It's basically 11, so it's pretty close. We also apply this to a series of uh, uh, benchmarking data sets. Um, here is the list of these data sets. Um, uh, the first couple of ones are synthetic, the rest are real world data sets. And um, here is the output of the algorithm, basically the orthogonalization. And um, here, what is important is this ratio, detail with over D. Detail is after orthogonalization number of uh, relevant features, basically. So you can see that, for instance, in ALL AML with about 7,000 features, the orthogonalization tells us that there are only 39 non-redundant features. And now in this table, I look at the prediction accuracy. So now, as you can see, with ALL AML, for instance, with 39 features, the prediction accuracy is going to be 97. So it's a bit, in fact, it's a bit higher than no feature selection accuracy. And it also works well with other uh, data sets as well and can reduce the, um, the number of features there. Okay, so this was the uh, unsupervised one. Um, if there's any question, please let me know. Okay, so let me move to the supervised feature selection. Now, again, remember that uh, in the supervised, now we are talking about the relation between the features and the label. And we want to find um, the discriminative features, the features that are relevant. So we already removed the redundant features with unsupervised. Now we want to find the relevant features and remove them so that uh, we get only the relevant features. Therefore, we need uh, some sort of a measure of feature uh, label uh, relevancy. So let me again revisit the optimal supervised feature selection. Now let's assume we know the distribution. Uh, well, um, again, we have this base predictor PEG, the error of the base predictor. And again, recall that the optimal feature selection was done with this optimization. Now, we would like to do this in agnostic settings. So we don't know have we don't have any, any information about the distribution. Again, let's look at the binary classification with zero one loss. Now we show that if we do again this orthogonalization and the Fourier, then we can show that um, the best predictor, the base predictor of Y, let's say from a given feature subset J is of this form. It's a sign of this function. And this function is written in terms of its Fourier expansion. These are orthogonalized parities. And these alpha s's, the basically the Fourier coefficients, are nothing but the expectation between y and uh, the psi tables. So this is coming because of uh, this arbitrary distribution that we allow for the Fourier expansion. And this gives us a, a, like a Fourier expansion for stochastic labels as well. So this is not only for uh, functions, but rather for stochastic mappings as well. Okay. Then we can show that the minimum loss, let's say with K features, with based on this Fourier expansion, is going to express with this equation. And what matters here is that it's in terms of the one maximization over one norm of this function. This therefore immediately gives us a measure of relevance. So we would like to estimate this quantity and try to maximize it. And this is going to be our measure of non-linear -re non relevancy for the features. And again, this is easy to estimate because of uh, the following procedure. Okay, the idea is again, we can do orthogonalization process as before. These alpha cells, we can estimate it easily with this summation between basically yi 
and this psi hat of xi. And once we have that, we can form this expression. But we have uh, a little bit more difficulty because this is not going to be biased. Uh, so we, in order to make it unbiased, we get uh, we, we deduct from it some additional term. But again, all of this is done empirically. And this gives us the uh, measure that we were looking for, this measure mg. And then we have a consistency of the measure result, which basically says that uh, if I select a feature by maximizing this measure, then the loss that we are going to get compared to the optimal loss decays uh, with one over a square root of n, and, or more precisely with this expression. So it's asymptotically optimal. Okay, so um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the whole uh, expression here depends on the number of parameters, uh, depends on the number of features we want to select, uh, the dimension, and uh, the num of course, the number of samples. Now, based on that, now if we put uh, the unsupervised uh, feature selection first, and then we apply this measure, and with the search that I mentioned, uh, we can get the uh, supervised feature selection algorithm. So here are the numerical results. Um, uh, these are the couple of uh, benchmarking data sets that I mentioned. And the blue curves, uh, the orange curves, and this uh, blue dot curve are going to be the supervised feature selection algorithm that I discussed. And the rest are uh, a set of the art algorithms. And as you can see, in um, many of these algorithms, it gives improvements, especially when we have highly nonlinear redundancy and uh, irrelevancy among the features. And uh, it, it works well with uh, small data sets, larger data sets, and uh, different sizes of the samples. And uh, with that, I uh, finish the talk. Thank you. Okay, guys, questions? So, Maxon, justify a little better uh, why entropy, this uh, information sufficiency and entropy, is actually a, a, a good measure for picking up uh, the relevant features. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, entropy, so it's it's a similar notion to the notion of uh, sufficient statistics. We like to, um, so, so we can see everything based on uh, information metrics. So now if we have these features to be sufficiently informative, if the entropy does not reduce, it automatically means that the conditional entropy of the whole data sets conditioned on the selected features is going to be zero. And that means that uh, I can get any information from the whole data sets by just looking at the selected features if the entropy does not change. And this is essentially what we want. We don't want to lose any information by selecting a subset of features. Uh, losing information does not necessarily mean that uh, we cannot predict why, but there are some scenarios that it could happen, that losing information could lead to less predictive power. And that's what we are trying to do. So why do why you think that this measurement captured nonlinear uh, dependency? Uh -huh. That's a good question. I think because um, so let's say if you have let's say the the feature D is a some arbitrary nonlinear function of the J one to J K, then again the entropy is zero, right? So the conditional entropy is again zero. So it captures all of these uh, functions. As long as um, 
and there is any function um, between xd let's say and uh, uh, j1 to jk any nonlinear function it can capture that um, because there is essentially there is no information uh, about uh, xd when i have xj1 up to xj okay so i have enough people from krakow any question okay it looks like everybody understood no no comments questions suggestions for the next talk the next talk moxon will talk about a uh, neural quantum neural network and you'll see how actually using some tricks you can comp you can actually design uh stressing gradient method for quantum uh moxon any anything oh, okay uh, yenj kula wants to have a question go ahead uh, yeah, I would like to have the or, uh, question about the organization of the rest of the curves because I don't uh, like I uh, suspect how it will look. But for example, will there be any workshops or the only two talks left? You mean when? The uh, next week. The next week is Moxon is giving a talk like today. And the week after, on May 24th, independently on everything, Moxen and I are organizing a quantum workshop, which will be called Workshop on Quantum Information Algorithm Learning. And there will be five talks starting at 10 a.m. our time, which is four o'clock your time. Uh, one hour talk each. So uh, the, you will see the workshop information from the web page when you on on your class. So let me see. Moxon, can you come, can you show what do we have? Can you switch it and show the some information? Let's see. Yeah. Let me let me. Um, let me find You found it? Yeah, I am uh, trying to um, share my screen again. Okay, are you able to see that? Okay. Yes. All right. okay. uh, so there is there is no schedule yet to be assigned. We're going to do it this week, and from the web page of your uh, seminar on on the when you're looking who is talking next uh, can you go can you go to the seminar workshop you know uh, go go basically go to so yeah nothing else okay okay and click it on events here csoi go down news and announcement go down no no new go new okay and you'll see here at the top, yeah, no, no, click here. Okay, go down. So you see May 24, there is nothing. What you will get, you will get a link to this workshop with schedule. It will be done probably this week. That, do I answer your question? Yes, and this will, this will uh, end the whole seminar, yes? Yes, and you can attend the whole one or whatever you pick it up. I will talk to Dr. Turoski about uh, your grades and so on. Everybody will be will get it passed, so don't worry about this. We'll talk it probably next week or at the end. Any other question? Okay, let's thank Moxen and see you next week, guys. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Goodbye.